This is Mike with Advertising Report Card. What we're doing here today is reviewing a Google Ads account before launch, and we are going to start recording and hopping in right now. All right, so out of the gate, looks like we're doing public adjusting. Let's check out the campaigns. So branded out of the gate, I imagine, is the branded keywords for this company. Let's check it out. All right, express public adjusting. We have broad match modified phrase and exact. This is what I recommend. Also, I recommend capitalizing the first letter just for best practices. Let's check out if they have any negative keywords. It's on the campaign level. These are all very specific. I would say that Probably a lot of these could be eliminated with just one negative keyword list phrase match. Since the list is pretty extensive, I want to take a quick look. So as an example, um, you see uh, the word auto show up a couple times here in this list. 11 times just out of these first keywords. If you just negative out the word auto, that'll take care of all of these different variations, which might be more beneficial than having to try to organize all these different variations. Best to do the one keyword inside the search term. If it's if you don't do any auto uh, adjusting, then just the word auto, automotive, car, uh, and phrase match, and that will block any of the searches from that entire industry. So just for reference. See if this has ran at any point in time prior. No, it has not. Okay, great. So this campaign looks pretty straightforward. Let's check out the settings. This is for the ad group. Let's back out and check out the campaign. $5 a day, manual CPC. Let's check out the cost per click. Oh, that's only on the keyword level since it is manual CPC. $10 CPCs for $5 a day means that you're probably going to get one click a day. I highly recommend uh, taking a look at what you're willing to spend as far as budget goes, but $5 a day um, isn't going to get you much. Understood that this is a branding campaign, so it's probably not where you want to put the majority of your budget. But if somebody is searching for your um, campaign out of the gate, you're really going to want to make sure that you get those searches. Because if someone's searching for that company's name and then somebody else steals that traffic, even though it should be a cheaper keyword because it's your company and it will be very much cheaper than other people because it's your company, um, it's just something you don't want to miss. So let's take another look here. Uh, we are still on the branded networks, search network and search partners. For new campaigns, I recommend just doing search network only. Search partners typically get you a lot more impressions, but not that many clicks. It lowers your CTR, which lowers your quality score. Um, I would highly recommend just doing search network at first and then moving into search partners if you want to try to expand. But best results are on the Google search network out of the gate. Check out the locations to get an idea of where they are. Looks like they're in the panhandle right here in Pensacola with some specific zips. This is good targeting. I um, In these smaller ones, if you have a smaller budget, which looks like it might be the case, doing this very small is good, but might not hurt eventually to put a geo here if you're trying to get more traffic and more search volume because you might not get a ton of search volume just from this little area. Another thing too, location options. People in or regularly in your targeted locations. Uh, people in or show interest in your targeted locations. I recommend this. Um, reason being is that people who show interest in could be anywhere. So you're on the right setting here for what uh, setting you want to be for targeting, in my opinion. English and Spanish. 
I do recommend doing an English and a Spanish campaign, even for branded. Reason being is that if you do English and Spanish, it's not as one-to-one. If you have serve an English ad to a Spanish-speaking person versus serving a Spanish ad to an English-speaking person, it might not make as much sense. If it's an all-English campaign, then I would just focus on English. Uh, if you want to include Spanish, that's fine. It's just not as advantageous. And also, uh, I've seen a lot of people in PPC say that uh, who answers the phone is the biggest deal. So depending on who's going to be receiving the calls, if they're extremely fluent in Spanish or not, it might be uh, a little bit more difficult to book those deals. So again, just the language barrier can be an issue. If it's not an issue, consider the fact that Google PPC performs best when things are one-to-one. So if you have an English ad with an English keyword or a Spanish ad with a Spanish keyword, your quality score will go up even more. So keep that in mind as well. All righty, let's check out the ad schedule. Monday, um, we we have a pretty interesting schedule here. It looks like it's filled up. It's just chopped into periods of time. You can leave this as is. Honestly, I would recommend just doing operating hours. Um, This is built like this, try to optimize for time of day. But, I mean, unless you have a big budget, it's not as important. I would recommend focusing on the hours of the day where you're going to be most likely to connect with someone to get a job in. I don't recommend running at midnight. Uh, Anytime after 10 p.m. or before 4 or 5 a.m. is typically not a time where you can hop on a call and book a deal. And since you have a finite amount of budget, you want to spend it. So if someone can pick up a phone and book a deal right then and there and close the deal and generate revenue, that's where you want to capitalize your budget. Reason being is that you can only do so many deals with the budget that you have unless you have an infinite budget, which most people don't. So you want to make sure you're allocating your budget, not just to the times where people might search. If you have like a hypothetical reason like, oh, people work, they don't have time after they put their kids to bed to do any research until after 10 p.m., fine. But if you're trying to target that, that one instance, you're missing out potentially on 10 times as much business in operating hours. So that's the best way to look at it is that if you can pick up a phone and close revenue, good. If you have someone fill out a form at 10 o'clock at night and you get to work tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. and try to reach out to them, you already have about a 12-hour gap between the last time they recognized your brand and they probably went to sleep. So the recognition, the interest is going to vary. It's going to be wavering. You want to focus on hitting people when you can generate revenue. Devices, what do we got here? Looks like we have no uh, bid adjustments. Highly recommend uh, setting up bid adjustments for mobile, especially when it comes to something where people might hop on the call and call and look for help immediately. Um, We get a lot more call conversions through mobile, of course. So there's a few things to look at as far as devices go. I would put a 10% bid adjustment just to start on mobile. And last but not least, demographics. Oh, I mean audiences. Sorry about that. So one thing about audiences is that you don't need to set this up out of the gate. But what I would recommend if you are going to be targeting a specific audience, that you try to look through these categories a little bit and see um, you know, what would be an idea that they say you might be able to benefit from targeting. So public adjusters, are you looking for the property owner who is reaching out to a public adjuster based off of a question that they might have about a claim? Or are you a public adjuster looking to work with construction companies so that you can refer deals? What's the, what's the overall targeting uh, strategy here? So another thing too about the ideas is this allows you to target people who have been searching for specific things. So home insurance, as an example, you can see here, people interested in purchasing home insurance is an idea of how in-market audiences work. The real point of doing this is it narrows and refines what you can show up for. And that in itself is extremely important. So if you are looking for homeowners, there's things that you can look for as far as that goes. Example home improvement. So 
So it's really just about what you think people who might be searching for are going to fall into these audiences. If they don't fall in any audiences, audiences, you can leave it. But the main thing is that um, if you can select an audience, it's going to refine your campaign, increase your quality score, and typically give you a cheaper cost per click. So that's the that's the secret behind audiences is if you can narrow it even more, Google's going to give you a little bit of favor based off of your accuracy. A thing with audiences too is you want to make sure that that audience fits your bill. If you put yourself in an audience that's irrelevant, it actually might hurt your campaign. So just make sure that you are focusing on the people who are going to be in the categories that are more relevant to your business. Let's check out the ads. So we have three ads here. One is a responsive ad and two expand the text ads. This is the new recommended setup that Google has been pushing on people to launch new campaigns. Let's take a look at these assets. So we have a bunch of different headlines and the three descriptions. Um, what I would do is, you know, I guess you can let this run and pull out the data. Um, I highly recommend running with some ads that are based off of what you think is going to be the most powerful impact. And then I would run six of those ads, find out out of those ads, the top two or three, and then start combining those ideas against other ideas that might be more powerful in a responsive search ad. Reason being is that with all of these variables in play, uh, you can pick any two of these in the description. When you stack all of these options together, what ends up happening is you're creating, you know, exponential variations. So if you don't have, again, an infinite budget, how many impressions are you going to get with the winning variation out of this before you realize, hey, I should pause 80% of this and only focus on what's winning? Google's not going to do that for you. It's going to try by using its algorithm, but it's not a perfect system, uh, as you can tell in the support documents when it comes to the dynamic it's not a perfect system it just does its best to provide the best result so again with the ads i recommend creating six ads with the most powerful content that you can and then moving into a responsive search ad by testing what actually worked from your manual test with the responsive search ad by adding more powerful statements uh, this especially doesn't really work well when there's a lot of generics, so it's just very important that you uh, don't spin your wheels on ads because you might have the best keyword, the best targeting, but if the ads aren't appealing and you don't have enough control over what makes them appealing, then you might not get the performance you're looking for. Check out the ad extensions. We have site links. Let's see where these go to. Okay, so it looks like there's a hashtag in the URL, so the site links, I guess, link to the different sections of the page. Very popular on a one-pager website. Uh, one thing I would highly recommend on that is if you're going to send people to the website on these site links is to make sure that there's a contact form or a call to action button in view of landing. Right here, I got connected to the R process section. Not a lot of content here. Um, general questions it's pretty limited it, it's it kind of jumps you into the sales pitch of what a website's supposed to do halfway through and i understand you know site links are supposed to take you to specific pages but in this specific example and any example make sure that there's a call to action in the conversion area very close by explaining the value prop uh, i just noticed too it looks like there's some uh some issues on the landing page as far as the headline goes. I don't know if you guys saw that in the recording. Uh, definitely rewind and take a look at that. Some of the, if you have too long of a headline, I think that there's not enough line spacing. Yeah, right there. Otherwise, it's a really good looking site. I'm a fan. Let's uh, take a look at these other ones. Call out. Uh, looks like we're reiterating a lot of the content from the ad copy in the call outs. This isn't terrible. I would just definitely mix it up. Uh, call out extensions you can have a decent amount of plus you know go through all of your value props uh, if you get a really good call out extension CTR wise I would highly recommend moving it into ad copy likewise if you get any good ad copy that is performing well move them into call out extensions because what ends up happening is Google starts to piece together the ultimate ad out of all the things that are winning 
Structured snippet. This is great. Very good. Very good. One thing that's missing here, which is crucial, which will kill this campaign, and I can't underestimate how much it will. Uh, reason being is that uh, if there's no call extension and there's no call conversions coming directly from the campaign, you could be missing up to 30 30 percent of your conversions. Uh, I've seen a lot of campaigns run just traffic versus calls and traffic. You got to get the call tracking up and a call number here. So not only when people call or click the call on their phone or call through their computer and the numbers dynamic so you can track it all, but you want to record the calls and make sure that the inbound calls, the questions that they're asking are relevant. The last thing you want to do is have your appointment setter getting calls in confusion, wondering why this person's calling or how or whatnot. And you just want to make sure that you can record all the calls from the marketing campaign so that you can do quality auditing and make sure you reach out to your client as well and explain to them like this person called from this campaign because A, B, and C. Likewise, sometimes people call and they're not candidates. They're not good leads. Now, that's not as a marketing thing what we want to res what we want to have results wise. So you also want to make sure that you're accounting for your own performance and call recordings are crucial. If you're getting calls that are just impossible jobs that no one's going to want to take, maybe you look at where those calls are coming from and limit the targeting in that area. There's a lot of things that you can do with just the call data. Um, another thing too is the ad copy. Uh, if you're getting a lot of calls from a specific ad copy, likewise, if some ad copy is delivering no calls, the call to action in the ad copy is what's going to push people to conversion. The need of them to go to the website is dependent on if they don't get enough information from your ad. If your ad is a one-stop shop, they're going to call you right then and there and want to do business with you. So that's another thing about the uh, dynamic ad testing is I would highly recommend building out ads that you are beyond a reasonable doubt knowing they're going to convert, that they have the best copy and the most powerful punches and that you looked at the comp competition and you're filling the gap and the need of the market and you're working with the business owner to make sure that the offers in the ad that you're putting up are strong and that they're unique and getting with the business owner and really saying, okay, well, what's like real problems that you're solving? Give me an example of business that you've conducted with a client. Walk me through this. Walk me through what you did and just listen to what they have to say because a lot of people in operations don't think about what they do as a value proposition or a piece of marketing content. They look at it as their job. So it doesn't have any glamour. But if you can listen to some of the stuff that they do for people, especially in the public adjusting world where they can greatly increase the payouts from insurance, having them explain that, there's a lot of ways to bring value. Um, sometimes it's even sensational, but at the same time, as long as it's grounded in fact and it's attractive, you might be able to get another conversion. All right, so let's hop into the other campaign, which that was more of an overview on the settings. It's almost static across all campaigns what we just went through. But as you may know, there's variations and there's nuances, which we're going to take a look at now. Let's go back to all campaigns. Search. $25 a day. I saw that on the budget. Great. So we're, we do have a little bit more budget here. Okay. Theft damage. Glad to see that um, the word adjuster is in there because just theft damage would not be a good keyword. Now, there's only one keyword, theft damage adjuster, that shows here. This is a very niche uh, search. As you can see, one thing I like to do, and I always tell people this, is that Google actually gives away what people are searching for in the recommended search area at the bottom of the page. A lot of people don't even notice this, but this is probably the best way to find keywords and get a better understanding of how your target market actually sees your services. A lot of people think, oh, this is what I do, so this is what I'm going to advertise. How do people find you is really where it's at. So let's take a look at this. What does a public adjuster do? <laughs> Well, as you can see here, there's a lot of people who are trying to enter in that industry. 
Um, let's just take a look back at the keywords. So theft public adjuster. As you can see, it's definitely a thing, and some people have actually optimized themselves SEO-wise to get there. Uh, but here we go. Churchill public adjusters. Look at that. They even optimized an emoji into their SEO meta title. This company's futuristic. Let's pop them open just as a reference. All right, so we're going to back out of theft and damage adjuster. Um, the thing about search is that it's amazing to get in front of niche topics. Um, you can be the only person with an ad on the right search because take a look. This search has zero ads running on it. Now, that might be because of my location. There's a lot of reasons why an ad might not have shown here. There's ads on the bottom, so that's probably where the, the, they probably just had this um, as a test. But as a test, I mean that Google's constantly testing their ad placement. Every single search, it's different. So it looks like we have a uh, different insurance adjuster content. Just leave that open too for reference. As you can see here, we have some site links. It's another setting that we actually have to look at. Uh, I missed. Believe it or not, I missed it. Location setting. Make sure that your GMB is connected to your Google Ads account and that your location, if you're a local business, is an ad extension. This can be a little more of a time-consuming thing for most Google Ads managers because getting a company's GMB and connecting it is like an extra step for sure. A lot of companies don't even know how their GMB was set up. With that being said, it's invaluable. It increases local interest and it also increases your quality score because it validates your business on a secondary level with Google saying this is actually a company. I'm not some fake person just dropping an ad to drive traffic, which is what Google's constantly combating against. So highly recommend that. Um, as you can see here, this is a, a structured snippet. Not all structured snippets are built alike. Um, I don't recommend doing unlimited structure snippets. Some of them have terrible performance. I just wanted to put that out there. Um, that you want to test them all to see what's going to work for your market and for your business. But uh, the structured snippets uh, are really best reserved for highlighting the services you offer. Realistically speaking, you want to have structured snippets because you want all ad extensions on all campaigns. That's what Google wants for you. With that being said, make sure that they're relevant and that they're marketable. Because sometimes you're, it's redundant too with the ad copy. I'm trying to see if there's anything else in this ad copy that we could uh, go after. I don't know. This is all pretty basic, honestly. I think this campaign could do really well because the competitive market seems to be not so good as far as strategy goes. Seems very generic. And what I mean by that is there's typos. There's a period in the middle of this sentence uh, posing a lot of questions with extra words. Generic, not delivering any value. We can help with that. I hope so. I wouldn't put that in my ad copy. Uh, it's pretty generic. And you want to be value punching. You want to be able to say in as few words as possible, there is nobody else you want to work with more than me. That's a local business advert. Uh, you can't uh, be generic. Insurance adjuster, these keywords are gonna get blown up. I think that there's a lot of room on the negative keyword list still. Um, I would highly recommend, in general, creating a negative keyword list to share with multiple campaigns as you build out additional campaigns and categorize your negative keyword list. So the reason why I would do this is because you want to make sure that you are adding keywords to the correct list and that you're mitigating against things like educational searches. How do you get certified? How do you go to school? What's this? How much do public adjusters make a year? There's a lot of different things that people are going to be searching that you don't want to show for. Even if they don't click your ad, every time your ad is shown, it's an impression. Clicks divided by impressions is your CTR. And CTR is a huge uh, quality score. Um, it has a huge it has a huge weighted impact on your quality score. So you don't want to show ads at all if they're irrelevant. Let's take a look at these ads. So 
So this ad group is actually a little bit more um, what I would recommend, except for the fact that uh, these ads look identical almost with the headline at the first not being swapped. Another thing about testing, I figured I'd mention that, is that you want to have, if you have two main call to actions that you want to have in every headline, there's three placements for headlines. Headline one, headline two, headline three. Swap it out, move it around, and make sure that you have different variations in play. Yeah, I would definitely, uh, I would write six ads uniquely. This is going to be the main keyword that anyone's going to search on this campaign. So I would spend a little bit more time on the ad copy here so that you're getting a good read out of the gate. Um, since this account hasn't spent, I'm not sure that um, it's going to get. any data in the keyword planner, but I think it'd be a good idea. So I think Loom is like really making my computer slow, so I'm gonna actually do a shortcut here. This is a cool, tri a cool trick I'd like to show everybody. Let me start that over. This is a cool trick I love to show everybody in Google Ads when it comes to their keyword and if it's ability to show. If you hover over eligible, it's gonna show you all the reasons why or why not the ad can't show. So billing details here, as you may see, is the issue but there's a lot of reasons that pop up over here and your ad could be showing, but only 20% of the time, if you're not actually looking at the status and detail, your ability to show an ad might be skewed to you. You might think your ad is live, but you're not getting a lot of impressions. It's not that the keyword is bad or the bid is bad. There might be a deeper settings issue and that's what this is all about. So if I click ad preview and diagnosis, It's going to give you a little phone here. It's going to show you all the ads that did show. And if your ad were to have shown up, it would be highlighted out here. And uh, they give a more of an explanation in this blank area as to why it's not being shown. But we don't have billing information, so it's pretty clear why. Also, the location was in the wrong place. Okay, let's go back and look at the rest of these ad groups. Business interruption adjuster. So my recommendation for this campaign being that there's a lot of ad groups that are, this, this is going to be a sure shot. Insurance adjuster, insurance claim adjuster. That's definitely going to get searches. What I would recommend uh, is that there's different campaigns, um, a campaign for your primary searches and then a campaign for the keywords that might not perform as well or have lower search volume because you don't want the whole campaign to get wrapped into uh, good and bad ad groups plus eventually what you might consider doing with that is having shared budgets and allocate a percentage to the secondary and then make the primary the one that is supposed to milk the overall budget the most um i did want to do the keyword planner though, just to get an idea. different keywords just to get an idea of what we can uh, expect for a cost per click. I did fire in there as a mix. Let's uh, change the location. Wow, this is um, Google's idea of helpful information. <laughs> This is actually kind of interesting. What it's doing is it's showing its overall expense on these keywords in a, in a general standpoint. It's not a terrible thing. Honestly, I think this is really helpful if you're trying to find research in specific areas for where the opportunities are. Google's trying. What we're really looking to do here is dive in Pensa or Pensa. Pensa. Cola, Florida. 
We're going to get rid of the U.S. Wait, that's not where this target is, is it? Yeah, it is. I think that's going to give us a more realistic expectation of cost per click. If anything, in the smaller area of Pensacola Beach, just expect it to be more expensive, in my opinion. Of course, um, they got rid of the keyword. So it looks like we are in luck as far as the low range. We could, you know, with $25 a day, get around 10 clicks, which at a 10% conversion rate would be great. But also, as you can see here on the higher end, uh, if you want the show at the very top of the page, you're looking at, you know, I would say probably on average 10 to 15 bucks with some higher ones and some lower ones to average it out. Consider what you want your monthly budget to be. Um, at this situation from a marketing and from a business strategy standpoint, you have to ask yourself this. If an adjuster gets one lead, how much money do they make? And then what are their expenses to make money on that? So if they are going to make five grand uh, doing a claim adjusting um, service and that's just one lead uh, and then the expense for marketing retainer is a grand. So that's $4,000 that they make in revenue and then their ad budget, let's put it at a thousand is $3,000. So that's one job. That's that's three thousand dollars in profit. It pays for itself. But if you have a budget of a thousand dollars a month, that's two fifty a week or fifty dollars a day. Even on these high end, you're going to be able to generate more clicks. So, in summary, what I'm getting at is that you want to help people understand where their break even is and set the right expectation. If they only put up twenty five dollars a day. That's seven fifty per month. So if the cost per click, let's just put it at on the low end of the high at like seven dollars. They're gonna get three clicks a day. Your conversion rate would need to be thirty three percent for them to get one lead per day. You're probably gonna look at like maybe one or two leads a week if you're lucky. Um, if the campaign launches really well, and that's gonna result in you know six to ten leads per month. He'd have to definitely make sure that he was working those uh, very, very thoroughly to make sure that they closed any deals. Uh, and the similar expectation, if we were talking about a 10% conversion rate, which is actually what the standard is, Google says that if it's below 10%, you know, you want to work on it. 20% is like the golden range. If you get above 30%, it's, it's magic. So 10% is really a baseline at $7 cost per click. You're looking at $70 leads. So how many leads can you generate with the budget that you have? Um, that's the, the overall review I wanted to give on this. And with that being said, if we can't get more budget, what do we do? Well, let's take another look at these ad groups and talk about breaking campaigns out again. I think based off of the budget that I can see that's set in the settings here for this campaign, which I'll go to settings to highlight this so it makes sense, at $25 per day, um, I would recommend moving the campaigns, bringing any of these unique things like vandalism, damage adjustments, theft damage, business interruption into its own campaign, and then... I would have insurance adjuster, insurance claim adjuster in its own campaign and then have a storm campaign and then, you know, maybe a flood campaign with mold and water damage. I would just break this out and then ask the business owner, how much money do you make off of these different services? Because I can tell you right now, these two ad groups can create leads for all these other ad groups. The difference is with these ad groups, they're more specific, but with more specifics comes a higher cost keyword. Fire damage. Let's take a look at the keyword here to give an example. Reason why I am highlighting that one is because I've worked in the fire damage 
industry. Cost per click was insane. Let's see what comes up in the planner though. So it doesn't look like that it's that bad um, on this search out of the gate, but let's go to keyword ideas. It's gonna remove my keyword. And in Pensacola, based off of the hurricanes, I'd imagine that um, flood and water damage and mold damage is going to be more searched, honestly. But as you can see here, the cost per click on the low range is 8 bucks for fire damage. So you're going to be paying more. So long story short, split up the campaigns. Make sure that you have keywords organized properly so that you can actually use this um, budget to the best of your ability. Um, out of the gate, those are going to be my main recommendations. Let's see if uh, – oh, sorry. Let me get back to that. Other than that, I think um, with those changes, it would be worth um, watching. Another thing, too, I wanted to take a look at on the tools. is Google Analytics and conversions. This needs to be set up before you launch. If it's not, you're going to miss out on more data. Definitely get Google Analytics linked. And set up conversion tracking. Google uses the leads that you generate to help you generate more leads. If there is no conversion tracking, not only will you not know if your campaigns are truly performing because they could generate leads from all sources, not just your campaign, but Google won't have that learning data to do attribution to find out how they can go out and get you your next lead by giving your ad priority. Highly recommend setting up conversion tracking. Uh, what you're going to want is form tracking on the website. And if there's multiple forms, like let's say you fill out this form and then you get to the next page and there's like a further qualification, you're going to want to get that form tracked as well. Any form really. Let's see what this one brings you to. Oh, see, as you can see here. This is bringing you to another form with files too. Yeah, this is uh, something you're going to want to track as well, absolutely. This looks like a good form too because it uh, uses files. I'd be wary on PPC campaigns of asking this many questions out of the gate on a form. Sometimes it's best to capture name, email, phone number, and then send them to the next page and then have them fill out more information. Uh, it's a lot easier to get more leads in if you ask less questions. And if you need to further qualify someone before your business owner needs to call them or wants to call them because he doesn't have all the information, qualify them on the second step. So that way, if they fall out of the qualification process, you can call them and ask those questions. Let's see here. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, pretty pretty straightforward campaigns, though. Nothing too crazy, nothing, no wheels reinvented, but I highly recommend uh, sharpening the blade uh, on the things that I had mentioned. Now, uh, this is something that you can do on your end. This is something that you can pass off to a marketer to accomplish, or if you want us to take care of these tasks, you just let me know. Advertising Report Card can take care of everything that we asked and more, uh, and as well as help manage the account if need be. If you have any questions, just let me know. Otherwise, talk to you soon.